Well, I'm going to keep letting people in, but we also want to get started because we've got an action packed hour ish ish is the big play in this whole thing. Um, and I just want to welcome everybody to the Bureau Rebranded Ish. Uh, this is going to be a lot of fun um, for y'all. I don't know about for me, but <laughs> I was talking with Bill and we were talking about uh, his book and we just had this idea. I wanted to rebrand the Bureau for a while because we aren't who we were, but there are also some things that we're very attached to. So we'll get into a lot of this as we get rolling, but Bill was like, let's do it. And then I was so lucky to meet Haley and Amy, uh, and they have done such a tremendous amount of work for us as well for the webinar, and hopefully beyond, we'll keep rolling. But with that, I'm going to turn it over to Bill and let 15 more people in. <laughs> All right. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, I'll dive right into some slides here um, and kind of get us underway. Because like Carl said, we've got a lot to cover, like kind of almost too much to cover. So hopefully some of this doesn't feel too fast. But the goal here was just to provide as much value and insight as possible and risk sharing too much as opposed to being really boring and sharing nothing and providing no value. So we've maybe we've over-indexed. We'll find out. Uh, let me share my screen. Now, little caveat, we got four people spot lit. We're going to have me sharing the screen as presenter, kind of sharing slides. So let's see how technical difficulties go or don't go here. Bear with me. I'm going to share my screen. I'm going to pick this screen. <laughs> and I'm going to go to presenter view. And I'm going to move this out of the way. All right. All right. Let me ask the silly question we all have to ask. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. I see Carl clapping. <laughs> all right. Welcome to the Bureau rebranded ish. We'll call if we'll qualify ish uh, here as we go. But uh, let's talk about what the goal of today is very specifically. So uh, there's going to be a behind the scenes look at our creative and collaborative process. Now it's not everything we do. Like I said, these are fragments of what we do in each kind of category of what we do. Uh, but it's going to be a lot. It's going to feel like drinking from a fire hose. I think that's a good thing. We're going to cover a lot of things. Um, we do plan to make this fun and conversational. So be super active in the chat. Like we actually want to hear how you feel about the things we're saying. Controversy is good. You can say, I hate that idea. I think this is really bad for the Bureau. Do those things. That's good. Um, yeah, buckle up. Let's get into it. So I'm going to spend just a little bit of time. Let's call it five minutes. I'll try to keep myself on the clock here. Who the hell are we anyways, just to help contextualize some of this. So we are focus up. We are a team of 20 plus brand enthusiasts. If you will call us brand lovers, call us a brand agency. I don't really care what you call us. We just, we love brand. We focus on brand. That's what we do. These are some of our clients. We all have to show this slide, right? Like, hey, we work with real people. Cool. I don't want to really spend a lot of time on this. You might recognize some of these names, but maybe more importantly, we work with real people too. Some of these names feel big. Um, and some of those are actually in the Bureau and I'll get to those in a minute. Uh, but one big name that we love to show or that I love to show, I guess, this was a catalyst project for us in our growth was working with Marketo uh, right before they got bought out by Adobe. That worked really well in our favor at putting us on the map, which has positioned us as more of like a B2B tech brand agency. But closer to home and more relatable is our pal, Ryan Masuga. Some of y'all might know Ryan. Ryan might be here. I, I don't even know, actually. Um, Ryan is a member of the Bureau, uh, and we had the pleasure of working with Ryan um, late last year into this year. This brand only launched this year. Of note, I'll just say in the bottom right-hand corner, you see this little thumbnail of me and Ryan having a chat. Um, one plug, I'll try not to plug too much. If you go to our YouTube channel, I sit down and have very vulnerable, honest conversations with the founders that we work with about the rebrand exercise. What was it like? What was hard for you? What, what didn't you see coming that you're like, damn, I wish I would have known about that. What was exciting? What have you seen as a result? So if you're thinking... And having these types of questions and you want to know from like a real person what it was like watch those interviews all right who's here today though you've got uh three people from our group 
uh, first, who's going to lead us out, even though I didn't do this in the right order on the slide. Haley's going to lead us out. Uh, she leads strategy at Focus Lab. Oh, yeah. Got it. You got it, Haley. Uh, was that practiced? Uh, you, uh, not you. Haley's going to lead us out and talk about strategy and the Bureau very specifically. Uh, then Amy is going to take over and talk about verbal identity. Amy leads uh, brand writing. She's the writing lead at Focus Lab. And then I'm going to finish on the visual side. Um, I am a designer. I, I was a designer, I guess you could say. I'm one of the original founders of the company. Uh, fun fact, tomorrow is our birthday, year 14. I don't need praise, but that's me. And that's how long I've been here. Uh, all right. Uh, don't worry about the stuff on the right. It's the stuff on the left that's important. When I say brand or anybody says brand, everyone goes like, well, what the hell does that mean? For us, what we do within brand, very specifically, is strategy. We're going to talk about some of that today. Verbal identity, we're going to talk about some of that today. Visual identity, talking about that. And then that, of course, rolls in to web work. We do not do development, but I don't need to waste time on why. And uh, then we support our clients post-project, helping them roll out and kind of present themselves to the world. So that's us, some of what we do. And now let's get into how we do it. Uh, Carl kind of already covered this, so I don't think I need to spend a lot of time on it, which is like, why the Bureau? Why now? Uh, interestingly, this conversation started as a very simple, yo, Carl, I wrote a book. It published last year. I'd like to come on and talk about it, selfish ask. As we, he and I brainstormed about how to make that actually valuable, he was like, you know, I really think the Bureau could use some brand help. And I'm like, oh, shit, why don't we like, why don't we just make this a collaborative thing? Why don't we talk about that? Why don't we record some things? Why don't we do exercises with you? So what you're going to see now is a result of some of that work. More specifically, something we do now, and I'll just share this real quick and move on, is this, um, we call it brand insights. It's essentially, a uh, it's kind of a strategic sprint. It's a one week sprint where if somebody's like, well, I don't really know if I'm ready for a rebrand, scary word, um, but I'd love to know your perspectives on what is broken here and help me understand what the opportunity is. Brand Insights does that for us. We're able to put a, a strategist, a writer and a designer on these for one week, sprint it out and send somebody like Carl, I think it was like a 28 page deliverable talking about the competitive landscape, the gaps that we see and the current kind of perception of the Bureau, even being members ourselves, et cetera. So we did that. We went through that exercise. We sent it to Carl. Uh, at the end of this, I'm gonna share a link where you can actually download that exact document. We're gonna uncover some of that findings, uh, some of those findings today, but there were, so, there were many more than we could share today. So I'm just letting you know that you can actually get that. Carl is gracious enough to say, yes, I don't care who sees that. Um, so, so go ahead and check that out at the end. I'll share a link. Now I'm going to transition to Haley, which is going to talk more about the findings here. Uh, just a quick slide, which highlights maybe some of the findings that came out of brand insights. Again, I would say, look at that doc. It's pretty exhaustive for a one week exercise. All right. I spent six and a half minutes. Now we're going to get to the meat. I think I did pretty damn good. <laughs> So with that, let's start where all projects start, which is strategy. And Haley's going to walk us through a couple particular aspects of strategy, two exercises to be um, very clear that we do with clients and that we did with Carl. Sweet. Thanks so much, Bill. Hey, everybody. It's great to be here. Yeah, let's get into it. Brand strategy. Uh, so at Focus Lab, we describe brain strategy as the process and the practice of seeing yourself more clearly. Um, so two of these exercises that you're about to see really allow us to take um, problems, complexity, big brand challenges, and make them feel more simple, um, distill them down, focus on the things that matter, uh, and let go of the things that, that maybe don't matter. So the first exercise we'll talk about is brand archetypes. Archetypes, um, for those who haven't used them before, they are universal stories uh, that can be used kind of as like a, like a character framework, so to speak, for brands. Uh, so the reason they can be so powerful for brands is because archetypes are built through 
emotional qualities um, and what it's like to be alive, be a person, be a human. Um, so it has each archetype within the stories. These characters have strengths and weaknesses. They have motivations. Uh, they have things that they desire and want to see happen in the world. Um, and they're easy to recognize. So some examples um, that you might recognize would be the hero or the explorer or the sage, right? You can immediately sense the story that's being told uh, through, through these frameworks. So at Focus Lab, the archetypes are an input to our strategy. We have a quiz um, that all of our partners take that lead up to brand strategy. It's about um, six to eight questions and you get your result immediately uh, on which of the 12 archetypes best aligns with your company, what your motivations are, the people that you serve. And when Carl took this for the Bureau, the result is the lover. Yes, do it. Perfect, beautiful. There it is, there it is, so you can see it. Yes. As a result of the true exercise. <laughs> yeah. Surprise, surprise. Um, all about connection, community, and the bonds that people share with each other. Uh, finding joy and holding on to it, creating connections with people, um, that you have something in common with people you don't have something in common with building a community together based on a shared sense of um, camaraderie goals and a vision for for the future. Uh, it's about building relationships. So don't let the name fool you. Uh, this isn't just about romantic love or indulgent brands like Chanel or Godiva chocolate. Um, these are brands that exist to create belonging uh, and create moments of joy. But how do we use it, right? So once we know a brand's archetype, we can uncover a deeper understanding of what really motivates and drives the brand forward and the basis for a distinct story that that brand can tell, uh, which we know is the whole point of the work we do and why brand even matters. So we want to use archetypes to allow us to kind of get out of our heads um, and push past the way we're used to talking about what we do, uh, whether that's offerings or meetings or selling and buying. Um, so strategy with the help of archetypes makes it about people. I'll just, uh, can I inject real quick, Carl, were you yeah. nervous when it came back as the lover? I mean, we see the love sign in the background there, right? Like, <laughs> No, I wasn't nervous. Um, I think the challenge was it felt like we're a little bit of each. Yeah. And I know it has to be more focused. Um, so actually, I was kind of relieved I didn't have to be a sage. Yeah. <laughs> fair, yeah. fair. Yeah. All right. I'll 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 move you back into your presentation, Ailey. Yeah. <laughs> and we can show you what we mean by this. So we brought two examples um, of brands that are pretty well known uh, that also carry the lover archetype, but in very different ways. Um, so love them or hate them, not the point. Airbnb and Subaru are both totally bought in on this story of belonging and connection. Uh, and it's a story that these brands tell over and over again with consistency. Uh, so I'm a Subaru girly. Um, Bill, I know you had a great experience recently with them too, right? You want to talk about that at all? Yeah, I'll just share a quick story, which is to say that like, you know, and I don't know if some people are thinking this, but let's, let me just assume some people are okay. The lover, like, well, how is that really going to inform all that much? Or like, do I even believe in archetypes? You know, when I put up archetype posts on LinkedIn, I seem not to get a lot of pushback, but there are some people that are like, eh, I don't really think those are valuable. And again, I welcome that conversation. I think that's fruitful. Uh, I went to the New York city international auto show, uh, on Easter. And I know maybe a strange day to go to an auto show. I did that uh, with my family. My son is big into cars now. He's 14. And we went there and he was all about, I can't wait to see Lamborghinis and these high-end like racing Porsches and all this stuff. And I was just kind of like, yeah, cool. I'll go. Like maybe I'll look at a, a new F-150 truck that looks awesome that I can't afford. And what I left realizing was Subaru had the best overall booth. And when I say booth, I mean, it was like a, a giant exhibit part of the building but I was shocked by it. And it's so strange now. So I had that realization there. I wrote about it on LinkedIn. That's been my best post. It was like three weeks ago that I've ever posted ever. And it's it was only great because I talked about what I saw and kind of made a thought provoking statement of like, 
could this be true? Could Subaru have won the event among all these other car companies? And it became successful because everybody agreed. And it's because of this effect. Everybody agreed, meaning the comments were wild because people love Subaru. So bringing that back to center to say the archetype and what they stand for and how they use this as a North Star, whether, they all, whether we all want to wear hearts or not, doesn't matter. This idea that they kind of understand who they are at the core, that allows them to build a brand presence around that, which we'll talk about further in this, which is verbally, visually, mission-driven, all these things. Uh, and I saw that firsthand. So yeah, Haley, that's Subaru was not on my radar as a power brand four weeks ago. And now it's like top of mind all the time. And Carl, I think you have a Subaru for what it's worth. So like all stars are aligning, sir. Yeah. When, when y'all brought Subaru up, I was just like, oh man, <laughs> I showed <you> car <laughs> keys. because yeah, it was like, that was a great car. It still is. That's where the dogs go to the beach in that car. It's, it's love. And it's, let me be clear here too, because Carl was very clear in our exercises with him so far. This brand is not meant to be Carl. Mm -hmm. but with somebody with the personality and heart, dare I say, an impact and care of Carl, attract like-minded people. I would say, by and large, the community also feels a lot like Carl. And therefore, the brand is not about Carl, but the brand is like Carl. Mm -hmm. So we don't all need to drive Subarus and be lovers, if you will. But I do think this is an accurate depiction of where kind of the DNA of the current uh, bureau lives. All right, moving on. Next slide. <laughs> uh, so we also included uh, a graph of other archetypes because you'll recognize them, right? When we say the outlaw, Harley Davidson, you don't have to explain much more, right? Uh, so this is uh, a graph that just shows some well-known brands and their archetypes as well uh, and kind of where the lanes are and where you can flex, right? Um, so the lover here is Chanel, but we know that that is totally different from the type of love and indulgence and um, aspects of the lover versus what we're talking about here too. And no one would ever think really that Airbnb and Chanel have the same core archetype, but within the strengths and the weaknesses and the motivations, the idea of building community uh, is important for both. Yep. Yeah. And I would just share one more point here, which is to say, we're not sharing archetypes first because we feel like it's the most important thing you have to do. Yeah. For some people, they don't maybe draw a lot of North Star kind of effect from the archetype. We share it here to say it's actually pretty easy to understand at its core. And you could even do this yourself and draw some type of North Star effect out of it to say like, oh, interesting, I'm that. That might inform this other thing I do better. That's why we're choosing to share it among the other things that we're going to share today. Like? Super approachable in that way. Yeah, brand attributes. So brand attributes, building on archetypes, uh, these are the most important characteristics for a brand uh, to display or demonstrate in practice and in the brand experience. So what I mean by that is uh, if you could do nothing else within your power, uh, and some might argue that that is the case, this is what you want people to come away with when they experience and interact with your brand. How do you want them to feel? And when the Bureau landed on these three attributes, what was once collaborative is now member-led. Um, I will mention that we we customized or tailored that one specifically for the bureau because collaborative felt close. But we wanted to we wanted the ability to reflect the experience of being in community, constant community. Um, it's more specific than collaborative, uh, and it's not about just Carl or just one person leading. It's everyone. So member-led, um, that first attribute, that is where that comes from. Supportive and catalyst, yes, of course. These feel just right, Carl. What? How do you feel when you see them? Yeah, I mean, they feel right to me as well. And it's one of those things, there, there's so many attributes you can look at. Mm -hmm. Calling it down is so difficult because there's something, well, yeah, kind of. I mean, we yeah. do, but... Um, what you, where y'all were great was reminding me that this is kind of like that impression that's somebody who's coming and what they need to see. And at that point, once we could change collaborative to member led, um, 
It felt right. I mean, Catalyst really helped a lot too, because we are trying to make changes for folks. We are trying to instigate heated discussion sometimes because some things just aren't right the way they are right now. Um, but yeah, no, I went, once I got into it and y'all were able to guide me in. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Up no before your final slide, Haley, I would just add like yeah. to the group here, everybody watching, like try to avoid words like trusted and things of that nature, right? Like, yeah, no shit. Like we all want to be trusted. Um, try to find things that are as, as unique to you as they can be, right? Like this is not the only community that could claim they've are or want to be member led, but that feels more ownable and more accurate and actually something to build off of than trusted. How do you build off of trusted? Right. Yeah. Digging a little bit deeper. One other thing, because we didn't mention this. Um, so while the archetype is a quiz um, where you get a result, the attributes is actually like a collaborative exercise um, where all of the attributes are in front of you and you say, we are this, we are not, we're not sure, whittle all of that down. I think it starts with something like 40 choices. You get that down to a top 10 and then ultimately um, three uh, that you move forward with. So it is very much um, empowering with the attributes specifically because you are choosing, it's a choice um, and you can choose to go for it and be catalyst if you want. Snapshot screen. Go for it. <laughs> so after these exercises, these are two exercises we do right at the start of projects. Uh, and there's much more co-creating time together after these exercises. We continue processing, figuring out um, what parts of the archetype feel right, which ones do we want to shed, how do we create an ownable, more distinct story specifically for the bureau or the brand. Uh, so strategy is research. And it is conversation and it is decision making, but it's also ideas and strategy is a choice. Um, it's surveying the landscape, the plot, the context, the audience, and deciding who you're going to be and making that happen, going and getting it. I took a swing at a very simplified strategy for the bureau here that you see on this screen. Uh, so things that we always include in strategy, the problem that is being solved, the people, most importantly, and then the position for the Bureau. So tapping into what we've learned through these two exercises together, it's about creating multiple connections and a network of support. Um, cohorts within peer groups, within a community um, where you're having real conversations and shared experiences. Uh, Carl, you just mentioned that with uh, Catalyst specifically. Um, these are hard things that need to be solved that people need support around. So from there, an idea, and how it can unfold. Um, asking for help is like tapping into a hidden network of connections with others. When you reach out uh, and you ask for help, you take that first step, it reveals something that you didn't know was there. These invisible connections that you have with people, um, rising tides lift all ships, uh, and you get to see all of the connections that you have with others, and you're not alone anymore. So some takeaways that I will leave you with, four things. The job of strategy is to distill, simplify, and channel direction. We got to find meaning throughout all of the mess of who you've been, um, what's at stake, what risks are you willing to take? We're finding meaning throughout all of that. Um, work with people who help you stay open and curious. Ideas cannot survive without that mindset. Co-creating with curiosity is very important. Uh, the third one, strategy is not math. No diss on any math people. <laughs> but if there is an opportunity, clear as day, all of your competitors are blue, let's be orange. Objectively, but it feels inauthentic. It feels like you're wearing a costume. It's not right. It's not the right choice for you. Um, and it's not going to work. We want to follow what's true and authentic about uh, your brand and your values. Uh, and then the last one is just a call to embrace change, right? This is a process. It's not easy, but it's worth it. Um, so we embrace change at every step um, because we know that that is going to ultimately mean we're becoming better. And that's strategy. So now we get to dig into what we do with all of this work. Uh, and I'll pass it to Amy, my pal. 
Thanks, Haley. That was great. Hi, everybody. I'm Amy, writer person. Um, I'm going to be speaking to you today about verbal identity, as Haley mentioned, but specifically brand voice. And I just wanted to start by kind of connecting the dots between what she has told us about strategy, what we've learned there, and what we do with that on, on the verbal identity side. Um, so as she mentioned, in strategy, we're basically identifying opportunities for where like a brand's communication could go, and then making some really astute, high-level recommendations. So the task then becomes, for a person like me, uh, to dig into those recommendations and make something of them. So my whole job is to take those recommendations that come forward, plus all the inputs that we've received, and start to do something with verbal identity. So that can look like creating messaging lanes that track to particular audiences, um, making a brand vocabulary. So your whole lexicon just for your brand, uh, writing brand stories, writing taglines. All of this is an effort to create a whole cohesive verbal identity that also serves the brand identity overall. So once I've done that, um, what I'm essentially doing is exploring or what we're essentially doing is exploring messaging. So what, what it is that we want to say, but at the same time, we're also looking at the way in which we want to say it. And that's voice. And that's what we're going to talk about today. It's the first piece that we start with in verbal identity work. It's really critical. Um, once we nail that voice, a lot of other things kind of fall into place. So how do we do that? Let's take a look at a slide about going to the bar. <laughs> okay, so before we start, before I like discuss this slide specifically, let, let's just establish what voice is. So voice is the style and manner of expression your brand uses to convey its personality, its character, its spirit, its ethos. So it's basically a who that's speaking. Um, it's the sense of a who. And sometimes, at the outset, when we're trying to determine what that voice can look like, because we're not always pioneering a new voice, sometimes we're just codifying one that already exists, but sometimes we can use a little bit of a creative exercise to explore this, which is what you're seeing right now. So let's imagine that the Bureau is personified. The Bureau has legs, the Bureau has pocket money, and the Bureau walks into a bar. So we kind of dig into, when we're imagining this persona, how would the bar, how would the bureau show up at that bar? So what would they order? What would they be wearing? What small talk would they be making with a bartender? If it's an old timey bar and it has a jukebox, what music would the bureau play? So we ask these sort of creative questions and we're really just trying to pin down personality. And we're doing other things alongside this, but this is one way we can do it. And then what you'll see on the right hand side of the screen is not necessarily the answer to the answers to those questions, but when we answer those questions, we can start to arrive at some qualities that could describe their voice or their personality. And now this is just like a quick and dirty list that I've come up with. Frisky, merry, wacky, cheeky, acerbic, carlish, ish, plucky. Um, and what I would invite you to do as we go through the rest of this talk is to think about this yourself. You are the resident experts of the Bureau's existing voice. You have interacted with all their communications, and I know there's a lot of content and material, and a lot of it is super voicey. So how would you describe the Bureau's voice? Or you can also just answer the questions to the left. What's the Bureau wearing at the bar? I think like the overall point is that we arrive at brand voice because we understand our voice so well. The only way to get there is if we understand our brand. And if we understand the people that we're speaking to, and that's our audience. So like clients, customers, prospects, members in this case, um, potential hires, partners, that crew all has the same question. And that question is, are you speaking my language? Um, if I asked you to describe a teacher voice, I bet a bunch of associations immediately come to mind. Maybe you're drawing from your experience. So you think of like the pedantic professor who was long-winded and boring. Maybe you think of like an exuberant kindergarten teacher. Or maybe when I ask you to describe a teacher voice, you think of like a pop culture reference, like Charlie Brown teacher. Maybe for you, teacher voice is Charlie Brown's teacher, which is 
droning and monotonous and flat. Or maybe you think of like Will Keating from Dead Poet Society, and it's like sonorous and dramatic. The point is, when I ask you to think about what a teacher voice sounds like, the reason these stick is because they've been so embodied by the people who are speaking them. So what your audience needs to know and what we're trying to do is to pitch our voice toward them in a way that like creates an instant kinship with them. Brand voice has the power to make people feel understood, to make them feel validated, and it can answer a bunch of, a bunch of questions that your audience immediately brings to interacting with your brand. Things like, do I relate to this brand? Do I even like this organization? Do they understand me? Do I trust them? Which is, I think, one of the biggest questions that Brand Voice can help answer. So in order to be memorable and believable, your brand's voice has to be consistent across all touch points. It has to be continually upheld. And this is, of course, to make sure that it's believable, you can buy into it, but also it can sustain and build trust. And then that leads to people having equity in your brand. Uh, you sound like yourselves continually, that goes a long way to creating trust. It supports a lot of things. And a lot of this stuff related to brand is kind of ineffable. Um, there's a real art to it. And we didn't do any kind of brand voice exercises with the Bureau yet. Um, so what we're gonna move to in the next slide is how we can develop brand voice. And we're gonna use what we do have from the Bureau to kind of see how that works. And this is reading with your ears and seeing tone. So I'm gonna explain what I mean by reading with your ears. One of the principles that's really important for us um, in rendering voice here at Focus Lab is this notion that, and a poet can tell you this, right? That when we're reading something or interacting with content, it's like a multi-sensory experience. We're not just reading a word or consuming content or information. We're like listening for pleasing sounds, like a good, tempo or pace. We're looking for emphasis. All of those things really matter to us. And even if we're not aware of it, we detect them and we start to get to attach to that. That is brand voice. And that's what's characteristic of developing a really good brand voice. So we carry that into the work that we do. So how do we do this? Using the Bureau's brand attributes. So the first thing we do is look at a lot of inputs that come, come forward from a client, right? So Typically, we would have a bunch of materials to look at. We would have meetings and we would actually hear what they sound like and how they express themselves. We look at how customers describe them. Um, we look at social media. We look at everything. We're trying to detect what voice already exists. And as I said before, we're not necessarily pioneering a new voice or creating a new one. We're looking to see what exists and then to give it a name and then to give people some rules around how to keep executing on it so we have that consistency, which then builds trust. So that's the first thing we do. But in particular, we focus on the brand attributes. Now we know the Bureau has gone through this exercise and just to remind you, those attributes are member led, uh, supportive and catalyst. So we have the three attributes. Those attributes are meant to inform both the verbal and the visual identity pieces, creating one cohesive identity. So they're kind of these like nice, thematic ideas that we can operate under and we can pull down from them. We also coincidentally create three voice qualities when we're doing voice. Why do we do this? It's because we want to create a layered voice for the brands that we work with. We don't want it to be one note. We want to give them room so that they don't always have to lean into one quality. They can lean more into the other. We want it to be rich and have dimension. You might be asking yourself then, why if you have three brand attributes and you have three voice qualities, wouldn't you just make the two the same? It's because the brand attributes can't always be like personified in a way that makes sense for voice. So like, I would never say she has such a member led voice. I just wouldn't say that. <laughs> I would say she has such a congenial voice. So in this slide, you can see how what I've done here, again, just sort of quick and easy, is taken the three attributes that we have and worked down from them to create kind of personality or voice characteristics that make sense. So I'm looking for each one to correspond and support all of those attributes while understanding that they can't necessarily just transfer over. That's the kind of work we do on the voice side, along with looking at all of your competitors just on the point of voice, 
and then providing you once we've landed on these voice qualities with examples as to how to use them. Because it's one thing to say, this is your voice. And then it's another thing to be like, and here's how you do it. Like, how's it actionable? Like that's hard work. So one thing we do is we give tons of examples. We take copy from our clients and rewrite it in the voice qualities that we are suggesting. And then we do another thing where we're like, here are all the synonyms for this voice. So if there's another way you want to think about it, right? Or we say, this is what this voice quality doesn't sound like. So if I said the Bureau, one of their qualities is confidence. Like that's a confident, they have a confident quality to their voice. Then what I would also say is, but that doesn't mean like braggadocious. That doesn't mean full of yourself. So we put all of these rules around the execution of this voice to make it as easy as possible for your future communicators to understand what we mean. Now, you might be wondering how tone plays a role in all of this, because when we talk about voice, we also have tone like attached to it. Tone is like the modulation of the existing voice. So it's the thing that allows you to move around inside of that voice, adapting to different scenarios without breaking character. I actually think that tone allows you to be more precise in your voice. So you can have less emphasis or more, you can be more empathetic in one occasion and less so in another. And one thing that I, one thing that I always think of when it comes to tone is consider how many times you send a Slack message, right? And you add an emoji. Now you might be doing this because it's fun to communicate with pictures. Sure, it is. But I think the real reason we do that is because we want to help people interpret what we're saying. This is a really good example of tone and how we see tone more often, uh, I think, than voice. It's just really easy to spot. And so we add things like emojis to our like quick communication so we can help people understand what we mean or emphasize certain qualities about it. It's a really good example of how tone operates. Now, when we're talking about something more longer form, it's different, but it's the basic concept. So in a nutshell, that's kind of how the process with voice and tone works for us using just one example, the brand attributes from the Bureau. I'm going to leave you with a couple of examples. And these are from brands that do a really good job of marrying like voice and tone together. And they're also really voicey brands in the first place. In other words, they're really consistent about how they present themselves. So you can see with the first one with Atlassian, that right away, good day. Remember when I was talking about like pleasing sounds to the ear? So it's casual, it's friendly, it's fun, it's all that, but it also sounds good to hear. You can also see that, see that with a lot of these, it's like really, it's direct address. It's implied, you know, implied person. You are the subject of the sentence. It's a directive. It's, these are all really, really punchy. You can also see the deployment of like certain language choices, like stupid form or alive and kicking ass. Like these, these are deliberate choices to conjure a particular feeling and to convey a specific voice. And they're really effective in that. Okay, so the last thing I wanna, what I wanna end on, and I will invite everybody to contribute here is did anyone come up with maybe some voice qualities or some answers to the questions about how you show up, the bureau shows up in the bar? Do we have anything fun to consider? What's the dress code, Carl? Who's got the best? Uh, you know, I mean, it, it's it's going to be a t-shirt, right? <laughs> but what's on the t-shirt? So, well, I mean, that's a great question. So it's, uh, the Bureau is so many different groups. Mm. that I think it's going to be, you know, some sort of a, a human enlightenment statement. You mm. know, it's, it's going to be the walking billboard kind of showing how you feel and how you show up. Oh. that's cool does anybody want to take a guess at what the bureau is drinking at the bar or not drinking oh right could be na could, could be, be na oh uh, it depends on which day it is okay <laughs> all right good answer all right. Uh, <laughs> all right well then i'll pass it to you bell all right let's get into let's get into visual okay so so far you've heard all right cool poke holes on the boat, try to find the North Star for the brand strategically. So we're kind of aligned on what we're doing and building. How does that then find itself into language? We're all in the Bureau here. So I think we all intrinsically understand the feelings that we're presenting. Okay. It's, it's more friendly. It's more congenial, the lover archetypes, all these things. And so now let's talk about how that manifests itself visually. 
Now, what do I got? Uh, I still have a decent amount of time. Um, I'll probably maybe spend 15 minutes here. We'll talk about visuals. So what we haven't done yet, yet, is work through the actual visuals of the Bureau. How do we now take all this stuff we've talked about? And I I would suspect I actually can't see the chatter because I'm in screen share mode. So I'm, I'm kind of in a dark hole right now as a presenter. Uh, but it, it would seem to me that we could all agree directionally what we're saying and feeling is right of how we all feel about the Bureau. At the end, I'll basically provoke the thought that I think the current visual identity does not match that. But let's 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 walk our way to that first. So in let's talk about exercises again that are that are actionable and that you could actually do yourself. I would actually just come back and note really quick the archetypes exercise is another thing that will be linked at the end of the document that you can actually go take yourself to. You can literally just click the link, you can take it, you can see what your result is. And if you choose to try to draw meaning out of that and put it into your brand, have at it. In the visual side, um, we generally start with what we call visual strategy. I'm kind of dumbing it down here just to call it kind of mood boards and, and more. I'm actually gonna walk you through a, uh, an actual project that finished. But let's start with mood boards. Mood boards are interesting because I think a lot of people are like, nah, it's more just design fodder. Like, is it really helpful? You're just putting like pretty things on a page and like, what's going to happen with that? We've actually gone back and forth on this as a company. How valuable are mood boards? Should we not do them? Should we do them? And um, I'm definitely of the stance of like, they're definitely helpful. They're net positive, if anything. So again, in a in a mode to try to find direction. So let's just talk about the Bureau specifically. And I guess I should contextualize. These weren't built specifically for the Bureau. I went and hunted through some mood boards for past clients. They fit the point I'm going to make. And I actually think one is very directionally in line with where the Bureau could go. Let's call it could. We deliver multiple mood boards when we do this. Mood boards help a client, especially on the client side and somebody like Carl. And Carl, you saw these for a glimpse yesterday. But to look at these and for me to ask Carl, yo, Carl, visually, all the things we've talked about now through all these exercises we've done for you, which direction do you feel like is the right direction? Now, we would probably have built boards that are closer in direction. But for the point of contrast here, I picked one that is more like B2B tech product, like it's literally like a SaaS product and one that actually very much feels like it could be a community. So, Carl, I don't need you to answer, but sure, come off mic if you want. If I asked you which one do you feel like is the direction we should go, you're going to pick the bottom right, right? I am. It, it just feels more grassroots. It feels less polished in the sense that it doesn't look like a stock photo. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, it just, it definitely, that's who I'd rather hang out with. Correct. And hey, voila, look at that. It actually aligns with all the other things that are not just fun words with no purpose. These things continue to pull down, to use Amy's words, to inform, right? This feels more warm, feels more inspiring, feels more member-led. It feels more human, which isn't a word in, in the list, but it does feel that. There's some handwriting down there. There's more fluid kind of shapes and movement. These things will create the kind of the facade of the environment that we're trying to create, right? We would want a new potential member to say, that feels this way to me. We'll get to how the current one doesn't necessarily feel that way. All right, so that's that's mood boards, right? So we would start with that exercise. But then how does a mood board come to life? So now here's where I actually have to switch and I'm not able to use exercise kind of information that we've done with Carl. And I have to show you like a different project. But I felt like it would be such a, missed opportunity to be like, and we haven't done anything else yet with Carl. So like, I hope that was helpful. I, I want you to see a project through. So here's an actual visual strategy page for a project. Now they would have gotten three or four options and this is what they picked. So this now led out the round one, as we call it. Round one for design has three distinct directions. I've done my best to simplify those. The document I went and pulled these from yesterday these three directions I want to show you was like an 80 page document. I've now given a page each for the directions. Now I'm going to go back and forth and hopefully not make you dizzy. You see the visual strategy, but kind of what Amy and Haley were saying, which is like, you want to create variants of that though. It's not to be so definitive that you just literally just pick colors off this and that's it. You want to kind of derive from that. So you say, okay, is it a little bit more muted? Is it softer? 
Is it even maybe more muted and earthy and abstract, but the language is clear? Or is actually a, a bit punchier? Is it more vibrant um, and has different types of feels? So this is actually from uh, another bureau member, um, Four Kitchens is the company. So when working with Four Kitchens, these were actually the three directions in the beginning. They went with this. I would say that's the right choice for the things I'm about to show you, their archetype and their attributes. So first, now, now you're looking at final outputs. Four Kitchens archetype was the creator, right? this idea of creation. They create better websites for a better world. Visually, you think about pixels and kind of building blocks, this idea of creating and building, right? It all spawns off of this idea of the creator. Now it's worth saying, not every archetype gives you so much potential to be so literal. Some do, some don't. But as you have kind of a mesh of things to work with, you can use the different tools. The creator lent itself um, very clearly to some visuals. Their attributes, vibrant, accomplished, and multifaceted. And now you start to see how that manifests itself visually. Vibrant, the color palette. You remember those palettes I just showed before that were muted? Not all that vibrant, right? It doesn't mean that color has to be the expression of vibrant. It could be that voice is the expression of vibrant, but you have to, you got to play into that. Something needs to control that narrative while something else might control the other narrative. Accomplished in this example was actually carried more by the language, I believe, in telling what they do and why they care. And then multifaceted, I mean, we can just, again, going back to like kind of like the pixel nature of the uh, visual language, the multifaceted nature of the logo itself, right? You try to like draw off of these things. So but I don't want to jump to the punchline, but if I start to think about member led and these types of things, I don't know that the current visual language logo, et cetera, carry that. That's going to be my proposition here. But what else happens in a project? Okay, we get to the style guide. Ultimately, you end up with all the tools to now present yourself to the world in the way that you've decided in the early stages, like we've done with Carl. What is the true representation of the Bureau? How do we all feel about the Bureau? And are we actually representing that externally to the outside world? Or is there a gap? There is a gap. Let's just be real. There's a gap right now with the Bureau. The style guide creates the tools now to say, let's close the gap. We can speak the right way now. We can attract visually the right way. And we can put all these things together to be like a compounding machine, essentially. You get a little bit of a one plus one equals two which is the true nature of the community plus expressing it accurately equals three, as opposed to, well, we're all here because we love it. And we're not going to go away, even if the logo doesn't align to it, but are we compounding the effect? Are we bringing in new members? And I don't want to put it all on the logo, but it's an easy topic. So <laughs> we'll go there. Uh, and here's just a, a quick kind of, kind of outcome. Right. Some might say like, wow, seems like a lot of effort for not a huge change. Some might say like, wow, what a big change. It doesn't really matter. The goal is it now aligns to the attributes in this example. Before, four kitchens, you see the knife, you see the bracket to create a four and a K. Actually pretty clever. Does that, does that say vibrant, accomplished, and multifaceted? Does that really speak to who they are and better yet, who they want to attract Moving forward, don't forget most of your customers are out in front of you, not behind you. The answer was no, right? They were going off of this theme of like, we're web chefs, which I think was, was interesting and cool in a period of time. They were no longer that. They're maturing. They needed to basically move uh, in that new direction. So there you start to see it. Also worth noting, going through a rebrand, and I guess I would say this to you, Carl, and the, and the group here, it doesn't mean you throw everything out either. Right. So although I might provoke some thoughts at the end, it doesn't just mean everything's going to be thrown out. Everything's going to be new. We're going to lose our baby. In Four Kitchens example, the color was really kind of like key to them. I would also say, and I'm presuming, I don't remember offhand, it was probably a differentiator in the space. Keep it. You don't need to throw it out. It's not hurting us. Maybe we can add more color. If I can go back a couple slides, we can add more color and add vibrancy. And maybe it's just not green everywhere. These types of things you can retain still while maturing. So let us let me get us to the end here, and we could do some Q and A. Let's let's also talk about what's in a name. 
we are not a naming agency. We don't claim to be a naming agency. We work very closely with naming agencies. We couldn't help but see a name issue. Even if it is so basic as to say, does anybody here call it the Bureau of Digital? Uh, that maybe I'm posing a question now. Have fun, run in the comments. Like if any of you tell a friend or peer, hey, you should join this community, it's called, do you say the Bureau of Digital? Or do you literally just say like the Bureau, here's the link. I'm in this community, the Bureau, it's great. So all that to say, uh, I'm proposing kind of on the spot that that just is dropped. That was also part of the insights document. It was also part of a conversation that we've started to have with Carl. So this is not like a pulling the rug out here, but this idea of like, do, does it need to say digital? It's adding length. In my opinion, it's adding confusion. This is larger than just a digital community. It's no longer just digital agencies. Why do we have this word? If anything, it's just legacy. I don't think we lose anything. I don't think there's any downside to cutting that word. Uh, Carl, are you getting backlash? <laughs> <laughs> um a little bit cool, uh, cool cool but the thing for me is digital actually deflects there are people who should be in the community that see the word digital and then decide not to join these could be really smart marketers who are running great companies who have great insights this could be you know folks who are working in traditional advertising or media companies but they're still really smart and they still need to find their people sure yeah. Yeah. Those are the questions we have to ask ourselves, right? Like, is it actually, is it a net positive or a negative? Uh, I think we all need to be careful, myself included, even when my company went through a rebrand uh, four years ago now. We have an affinity for the things we're used to and we love because we've attached meaning to them. To other people, they don't mean that thing, right? So for organizations, they have to, again, think forward into the future of who they want to attract and what that thing means to somebody that has no relation or affinity to that word, or for that matter, to a logo. All right, we're gonna live design a logo in uh, nine minutes. No, just kidding, <laughs> just kidding. Um, all right, let's talk about a logo. Logos are not meant to be the end all be all. Please God, that I mean, that's the hill I will die on. And those will be the wounds of my life when I'm done with this career, which is like every branding project seems to hinge on a logo. So it is not that, but, a logo should at least attempt to some degree, large or small, align to all of the things we've just said above. These things. Is it warm? Is it friendly? Does it actually present a world where people say like, oh, that must be a supportive, nice community that creates a catalyst for change and people love getting together and whatever these feelings are that we all feel, does this logo do that? Logos don't have to do that. They should at least try to do that. And if anything, they shouldn't be counter to that. So again, I would, I would say, I feel like the shield does not represent the community. I'll, I'll just say it. I'm part of the community. I don't, I don't really care. I also have been doing this for a long time and I know that like companies don't live and die on logos. So it's like, it could keep it and be fine. It could remove it. And I would say be better. So it's one of these things and that's where people have to come around on branding and rebrands and all these things. Like they hold on to certain kind of relics as, well, this defines us and I've grown attached to this. Yeah, but it doesn't really actually, it's all of us. It's the people. It's not that simple shape. And I promise you, if it goes away, you'll forget about it. Now, another point though is if, big if, not like Carl has signed off on these things. I'm just throwing things out there. If the name is now the Bureau and it is a shield, those things get real serious real fast. I tell somebody I'm in a group and it's called the Bureau and I send them to a thing and it's just a shield and the, the opening kind of H1 on the website doesn't present itself in a certain way. I'm going to get a certain vibe of the community that is not right. So not only do I think the shield doesn't serve well currently, I think with the lack of digital and it's just called the Bureau, that word can be heavy too. So I think there's a lot of things up in the air for what it's worth. I don't want to suggest everything should be thrown out. I'm not even suggesting much is terribly broken. It's about opportunity. It's about thinking about what is ahead, what this community means to all of us, 
and how it might represent itself to the world moving forward and attract like-minded people. And I'm simply saying, I don't think the current visual identity does it. It doesn't matter, right? It's, it's, it's just really basically saying like, I just, I just don't think it does that. I can love it all I want. Does it work? So that's the big thought provoke at the end. We don't have the answer yet. We don't have the answer yet, but we are determined to continue to work through this. We wanted to make this more of an open conversation. I know we haven't prompted too much conversation here yet, but I would, I would ask y'all to continue to engage in the community. Think and noodle on this. You don't have to give us logo ideas, but just like ask yourself, like, does that really represent who we are here? Carl's wearing one of the shirts right now. It doesn't mean that that shield now is the bad guy and we got to throw everything out either, right? You start to get some vintage legacy gear that people are like, well, remember the old, the old logo. That was so cool. And people are like, yeah, I still got that shirt from that conference 10 years ago. Like, that's cool. Like embrace the history, but be willing to move forward. All right, I'll shut up now so we can get to Q&A. Quick notes at the end. Um, you can download that full brand insights document we keep talking about that I showed in the beginning that we really dug deep with the Bureau and, and looked for all the wins and where we think there's opportunity. You will be able to click the link. You'll be able to get that whole entire thing. Uh, you'll also be able to, if you're interested, of course, we got to plug ourselves. Get on a list if you would also find value in that. And then finally, if you want to go super brand nerdy, if this topic is of high interest to you, I gave you resources from our blog, from our podcast, from our YouTube channel. I plug my book. You know I got to do that. Uh, you can find all that stuff as well if you want to go deeper on so much more that is Brent. I'm going to stop share. Let's talk. Yeah, I'm going to, um, before we get into q and I just want to say a few things. Um, first of all, all the information, all the the input that came in the chat, we were talking about going from Bureau of Digital to Bureau, we we're talking about the Shield, and there were a few questions in there. Um, so for those that don't know, I didn't start the Bureau. Uh, I was an attendee and I took over in 2014, 2016-ish. It, it, it was a bit of a transition to driving my dad's car um, and trying to figure out what the hell this thing was. I knew it, I'd been there from the beginning, um, but it was originally the Bureau of Digital Affairs. And I dropped the affairs part when we were going to tropical islands for a week together. I thought that word doesn't feel good. Um, of digital, everything's digital now, some people will say. Uh, other folks say digital really relates to me. Like I, I totally get it. But, but one of the comments I wanna come back to here real quick, um, and this is from Polly Thurston. I'm a newer member to the community and my first impressions of the brand and website did not communicate the great warmth, collaboration and support that I've experienced since joining. I think the shield uh, was originally monochrome. <laughs> and the one change I made was I added color to it because I wanted, we, we actually call it our ally shield, right? So it's like one of those things where we wanted other folks to see it. I do appreciate folks who say it's a sense of protection. It's a sense of a safe place. But for somebody who's never met you before, is it? And I think that's the thing we have to realize we're experiencing it. So we're projecting what we experience to it. Um, and then the last thing, and we'll get to the Q&A, um, the word catalyst, I, th I think there are two ways that that works. One is that as an entity, the Bureau is a catalyst trying to get people to think more about humans, trying to get people to think more about business, the way that it could be run. But it's also for individuals. For me, the Bureau bailed me out of a really bad time. Like I really needed it. And I have so many people who've come up to me and just said, I almost lost my company. Uh, my life was in shambles. I met people here who were able to help me. The Bureau is about finding your people. And there are a lot of different types of sub-communities for different folks. So for me, it's almost a less is more kind of, uh, kind of situation where you can read into it what you need to. But yeah. at the same time, anything that's deflecting folks, I think becomes a problem. Again, I would just crawl from, find the next question you want to queue up but while you're doing that i would just say the things you've just expressed god i don't want to pin this just out to a shield shields don't say that they quite literally don't say that shields are you stay away from me i'm protecting myself from you right it's a it's a it's a defensive tool um or it's a we're strong and we're trusted and we're a shield and you can trust us to do your your legal affairs type of stuff right it 
it just doesn't embrace what this community is. And it doesn't matter that we've maybe now all built some meaning into the shield and love it for that. It just, it still doesn't mean that. So we need to not be afraid. Yeah. Um, all right. Let's get to some of the questions. So I am going to go ahead and go with Maggie. Uh, Maggie had, how do brand attributes and business UVPs work together? Good one, Ooh, who's going to take that? <laughs> Might be a combo. Haley, you start. Okay. So from brand attributes, when we're defining, so we have the, the words. And then a step further than that, we actually create unique definitions for each of those attributes. So we're not pulling from the dictionary. We're saying, Carl, um, the Bureau, what does Catalyst mean here? and for us and for this community. Um, so it's probably not what Marion Webster is gonna tell us is catalyst, right? Um, so that process through um, aligning and defining the attributes for ourselves, then we move into, okay, so we're looking at evaluations of today's visual and verbal identity. Where are we already hitting those marks? Where are there opportunities to amplify how we show up in terms of those attributes. And so as we move through strategy and those evaluations, we we create a really clear picture at the end um, of all of these opportunities of here's everything that's working really well. Let's hold on to that. Let's amplify that. Here are the things that now we know we need to solve where we're not showing up as, uh, I'm making something up right now. We're not showing up as member led in this specific area. Um, so Amy and I on a project would work together on where those gaps are and where we're closing those gaps. Um, so when we talk about situational messages, um, it's it's coming after the strategy is baked. Um, and yeah, Amy, take it away on, on what happens next. Yeah, no, that was a really, really good explanation. I was gonna kind of go in the same direction that by the time we get to situational messages, um, we've done all the strategy work. We really understand those brand attributes like intimately well. Like Haley said, it's a personal definition that we've crafted with the client. So it, may, it really resonates for them and we're all on the same page. And then we go through the voice exercise. We do the whole voice thing. And so by the time we get to situational messages, which includes value propositions for both like, you know, brand and product sometimes, um, and the USPs, by the time we get there, it's like so in our head what these attributes are that they're just like brought to bear when we're making those statements. I mean, we have other things that we're concerned with in making situational statements too, like uh, other considerations that we need to be aware of. But at no point are the attributes like not in our head because they're kind of that North Star um, is what I would say. I hope that answered the question. <laughs> All right, great. Let's move on. Uh, we've got a lot of questions. So I think this one may be answered with uh, some of the um, tools that we're sharing at the end. But Matt was asking... Uh, what lo would love to know what sort of questions are or were asked when discovering the archetypes to fit the brand. So is that linked out? It it will be linked. Yeah. So we could spend time. It's actually going to be more valuable um, to the question asker. Literally, just you can link, you can go right into it and you're going to get asked the, the series of 12 kind of questions and you're going to fill out and you're going to see the whole thing like in fine detail, better than we could even try to explain here. Awesome. And then Micah asked, why only three? Why uh, three on the attributes? Yeah, for the attributes. Sorry. Well, I can give my opinion, but I don't. I that wasn't my section. <laughs> you can give your opinion, but I'll I'll give I'll give mine too. Um, so when we're talking about identity and we're talking about attributes, we really want to stay number one at high level because again, these are these are stretching across visual and verbal. Um, they're not just for one or the other. They need to inspire and and um, be a foundation for each. We really attack it in three because we're we're creating a three dimensional brand, right? So we're talking about attributes that can hit consistently without it being too many to where mm, we can't 
we find that three is the sweet spot for those reasons. If we have too few, we really are getting into the territory Amy was describing earlier, where it just feels one note um, and we're not expanding. And then if we're dealing with more, knowing that we also will have voice qualities, it just becomes um, too much in our in our um, experience. Just three is three dimensional and it allows us to be consistent and extend as far as we need to for the purposes of both visual and verbal is what I would say. What would you say, Bill? Basically what you said in dumber words, um, sure. right? If, yeah. If, if I'm trying to describe the type of house I want and how I want it to feel, but I use 17 words to try to capture, I want it to be like a farmhouse, but kind of like colonial and, but kind of like, and maybe words that would seem like they can work together. Well, how's the builder going to build the thing and how is it's never going to express that. So like you just, yeah, I think you want to go as narrow as possible, but I love the point of like, you can't be one note on anything. You can't be one note on visual. You can't be one note on the attributes. You have to have some flex there. That was awesome. Um, Alexander asks, does each company lean toward a specific archetype or can they be a mix of different ones? And, and this like the full list. So I'm not sure what that last part was, but do you have to be a specific archetype or can you Frankenstein a little bit? You can totally Frankenstein a little bit. So that quiz will also um, output if you have a secondary archetype. Why was I not told this? <laughs> I don't. Carl, your sign says love, buddy. I mean, it was there. It was meant to be. It was meant to be. Um, so it will output a secondary if you're really close to two. Um, and for sure, yes. So what we usually do from there is... Um, while the quiz only includes the 12, we have a book of all of the other archetypes and the families and how they associate with each other. So again, we'll take that as input and then in conversations say, okay, well, what's feeling right? What's not? Maybe there is a um, an archetype within the same family, but maybe the motivation is slightly different. Let's lean into that. So. Um, an example might be um, the networker, right? That's uh, a, from, uh, a family of the archetype, but it's more about creating connections in a um, in a global sense, so to speak, more than belonging, which was what the lover um, the lover counts. Does that help? Yeah, I would share. I would just share one other thing too, like. None of this has to be so prescriptive, meaning when we did our work with Marketo, we went out there with the big book and we moved all these mm -hmm. archetype cards around. It was their CMO, even the CEO, head of design. And we had a lot of fruitful conversations and they landed on three. The other two basically became non-existent. And it was this idea of the maverick. Their archetype was the maverick, right? They wanted to be that player in the space. Although we've just walked you through an exercise that shows you how it can inform everything, it doesn't have to. For them, that didn't necessarily inform the visuals all that much. But what they would constantly tell me is like, Bill, now that we know that we want to be the maverick, even our conversations internally, our decision making around business, right? Oh, we got to be the maverick. Like this, we should actually be building this product and be kind of like the leader, even if we're going to fail because we're the maverick. Right. So you have to determine on your own what these things help you solve for. We gave you a very kind of linear flow. It doesn't always have to be that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, I would just underline none of those inputs have to be prescriptive. Right. Yeah. That was awesome. And in most of our meetings, we say, what would a lover do? No, we don't say that. We never say that. We don't even have meetings. So, so there you go. Thanks for that, Haley. You do not also, need a secondary archetype. Also, totally joking. Uh, I I landed right where I was supposed to. I'm just picking on you a little bit. Um, we did have a question about the big book of prototypes. Um, is that a focus lab book or is that one that they can find online somewhere? I bet you wish it was a focus lab book. <laughs> That's true. It is not. It is not. It's called Archetypes and Branding. And yes, you can get it. Um, I'll find a link and, and drop it in the chat or we can add it to the deck um, if we awesome. want. Well, yeah. Right. And I know some folks are having to leave. We are going to get through the rest of the questions. So when we send out the video, you can come back to it. Um, Claire asks, how do brand attributes and brand voice relate or work together? 
do you ever use the same words for attributes and voice? Yes. The answer is yes. So if they're like, let's say there's, I don't know, maybe there's an attribute and it's like, I used the word confident earlier. Well, that trans translates really well. And obviously to voice, like we can totally pull that down and unpack that. Um, so yeah, we do. Um, the other way that they work together is just kind of a little bit like how I described is that we're really wanting to make sure that those voice qualities are serving the attributes. They need to make sense together. Those attributes are like the umbrella. And so it wouldn't work if we had voice qualities that were just like over here under the wrong umbrella. They need to make sense. They need to be serving it out or carrying out like the promise of the attributes on, on the verbal side. But yeah, I mean, we can, I mean, I've had cases where I've used two of the attributes to be the voice qualities just because they were personifiable, but often they're not. And we don't want the attributes to have to, like, they shouldn't be boxed in in that way because they have a larger job than, than voice qualities do. It's way more grounded on the, on the voice quality side. Haley, do you have anything to add to that? No, I think that's perfect. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Thanks, Amy. Let's see, from Damien, how does tone differ in external and internal messaging? It depends on the communication scenario. So like if you think back to the pandemic, um, maybe you had like a company who had like really upbeat communications, like that's their vibe, that's their voice, but then they now have to send out a message that's really serious and, and somber on some level. That's an example of when tone comes in. So they have... Their tri the trick for them is they have to still sound like themselves, but then also be right for the occasion. That's a good example of tone. Um, internally, I mean, if you're talking like, if we're talking to our team members, obviously we can be lighter, more spirited, more casual even. So tone could let us flex there too. Um, but yeah, it really just depends on like what the piece of communication is itself. In terms of I that. think that's a that's a great point. It's worth sharing, even from our own experience at Focus Lab, right? We, we all went through COVID, and we even had a, a challenging year last year, uh, just with the kind of global global economics. But um, there's an undercurrent. So, and there's an undercurrent to your voice. Meaning at Focus Lab, the undercurrent for us is just always to keep it real and be authentic. We can be authentic and be super upbeat and super jacked up about a thing, like the bureau. We're going to throw this damn shield out or, or we can be authentic and be somber and say, Hey, this is a really tough time right now. Like I, we have to keep it real with all of you and the things that we're going through or COVID and all these things like, but it's still, it's still us, right? So you're still capturing your true self and you can kind of play the different notes, I guess. Yeah. Awesome. All right. We've got two questions left. Um, Mr. Carl Sakis, who happens to be co-member of the month. Congratulations, Carl. Although he left because he had something to do, whatever. Um, so here's a question for Focus He had Lab. a kickoff, Carl. He had to go make money. Hey, Acceptable. hey that was his choice. He made it. <laughs> um, question for Focus Lab about rebrands and stakeholders. How much of the process should be descriptive versus prescriptive? For example, what the brand is today versus what it aspirationally becomes in the future and driven by the brand owners versus other stakeholders. Oh, there's a lot of stuff in there. <laughs> Good job, Carl. I see why you left. Yeah. And then he bounced. Yeah. Well done, Carl. Uh, bomb. I guess I'll, I'll take a stab at it and let the, the smarter people in the room say it better. Actually, I'm going to let them start. <laughs> Um, okay. I will jump in on the, how much of it, Ooh, Carl, you might have to read it to me again. How much of it is aspirational versus actual? Was that the, the sentiment? Yeah, I gotcha. Um, let's see how much of the process should be descriptive versus prescriptive. For example, what the brand is today versus what it aspirationally becomes in the future. Mm -hmm. And then a second part of that, driven by and should it be driven by the brand owners versus other stakeholders like how do they play together okay okay let me tackle that first one and then um we can open it up to to tackle the second half it's actually really relevant to the bureau if you think about it i'm kind of the brand owner but the community is the stakeholders yeah 
Yeah. Um, so my hot take on the first half is that it has to be both. Um, it has to be um, correct and, and um, describe where you are right now, um, but it cannot leave you there. So the job of strategy and the job of brands is to um, do all of the groundwork and the foundational aspects of, of what brand building is in order for you to feel like you can take a step through a door that you don't know what's on the other side. Um, so we talk a lot about good risk and a lot about um, what are the things that we need to know in order to say yes to an idea and believe that it's true and believe that it's real um, and then go get it. So it definitely has to be both. Um, and that's not just uh, that's not just me not answering the question. <laughs> it is both. It has to be true to who you are today, but it but it also has to allow you to make really um, informed and confident decisions about how you are already changing and where you can go next. Um, and where it comes to stakeholders, yeah, I think that is um, also a, an evolving conversation. Um, That's yeah. kind of the hardest part of the job right there, quite literally. So like who's owning it, who's weighing in. And for any of the people here that are service-based businesses, I'm sure you run into the same thing no matter what you're serving up. Um, the pure answer, though, is the owner of the brand should be the one doing as much of the deciding and directing as possible. It doesn't mean stakeholders don't matter. You certainly need buy-in, but you don't need, let's just call it, you know, whatever, let's keep it real, like outsider opinions that are subjective and personal when they're not as close to the brand or what it can or should be, but you can't keep those people out either. So that's like, it's 14 years in, it's still a problem that we run into, if not more often, because our clients have gotten bigger. It is an acute challenge that we have to navigate of like who are we trying to appease here yeah and i i think you nailed it uh haley and, and bill um it can't be completely collaborative that's right you can't have consensus when it comes to something like this it's uh yeah. and to your point that brand owner they're the ones who've heard all of it so it's like they are that knowledge holder of of what's going on out there, what people are, what the chatter is. So, okay, great. And it would take a galvanizer too, quite honestly, like, you know, the brand owner is also a galvanizer. You're set up for success. Carl, you're a galvanizer, right? I, I feel like no matter what, what you get, I don't know, let's think into the future, what, what you get as a final solution, if we just want to dumb it down again to logo, you could galvanize the community around that in a way that we would all be able to look past our subjective feelings on day one and, and move beyond that. If the brand owner doesn't have that power, superpower even, man, that's a tough, that's uphill sledding, right? You don't, you, you miss out on buy-in, the adoption is low, and then it just kind of like, it cracks a little bit. Thanks, Bill. So it's all on me. Got it. All right. In fact. <laughs> All right, we did have one final question. This came in from Max. Uh, can Focus Lab look back and see if they did each archetype or studio brands attract certain archetypes? I'm not sure if y'all understand that. I'm not sure I do. Yeah, so we have, we have done each archetype on a project. Um, we have had clients fall all across those, those 12 main archetypes. Um, and I think this is what the second part is asking. Uh, I, there are definitely seasons where, um, people are, um, attracted to certain motivations and certain feelings when it comes to brand. Right. Um, so an easy example of that would be, um, in 2020, it was very much a pattern that people wanted to be uh, comforted and people wanted to have brands that felt um, really um, gentle and kind and relaxing and calm. And we saw a lot of um, 
green rebrands and we saw even like the pink color of the year and the Pantone color of the year, like all of those were very serene and um, and what we needed at that time. And brands are a reflection of, of culture in that way and of, of what is happening in the world. So yes, before that we had uh, a lot of like disruptors. So we also have seasons where people come in and they really, you know, they're starting new categories or they want to, um, they want to be the newcomer in a market and, and, uh, you know, challenge the giants. Uh, and so we've also seen seasons of that certainly. Um, and lately it, it feels like a really good mix. It feels like a lot of, um, a lot of connection, a lot of thought leadership, um, that clients want to be, um, in charge of and, and putting out for for their communities. Amy, would you anything else come to mind for that one? No, I think you said it really, really well. Yeah, agree. I think we might be on the precipice of the game changer vibe again, though. I only say that for the past couple client meetings I was in. Like there's big ambition kind of coming from some of those calls. They're not trying to be safe at all. They're like full moonshot type of vibe so that we might be finally kind of getting back to that. Not that one's better than the other, but it it's interesting. I think your point is, is really interesting and powerful Haley of the, like sometimes brands follow just overall culture kind of follow the vibe of the world. You gotta, each brand is unique and it has to be, it can't just be off of the, the emotional inputs of the world, but you can't ignore that either. Yeah. It's interesting. Well, that brings us to the, the last question. We, we just answered them all. Nice job, everybody. Um, thanks to the almost 50 folks who hung out for the Q&A as well. I uh, really appreciate that. And uh, I just want to thank the Focus Lab team. Um, Haley and Amy and Bill, you did such great work. Hopefully we're not done. I would love to, to keep moving forward on this. And for everybody who attended, um, I will send this video out. And I do have some questions for everyone because I do wanna hear from the community. I do wanna understand what of digital means to you. I do wanna understand the shield and uh, maybe we find some of the attributes of those things that you care about that we can find another way to share. Um, but I'm pretty hardcore on the of digital. <laughs> so we'll talk about the shield. Come at me, come at me Bureau. I know who you are. Um, but seriously, thanks to everybody. I appreciate everybody showing up today. Again, another shout out to the Focus Lab team. I've known y'all since way before the Bureau was in my uh, my radar there. Um, so it feels really special to have y'all doing this for us. Thank you. Yeah, this was awesome. Thanks so much, Carl. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Ciao, 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 ciao. All right, everybody. We'll see you later.